Brothers and sisters, let us pray. Almighty God, Heavenly Father, we give you thanks this morning for your goodness and love to forgive us in our trespasses. When you found us to be sinners, you sent your only Son, Jesus Christ, to die for us. And in rising again, he brings us into new and everlasting life with you. Father, may we never forget or never minimize this great sacrifice you make for each of us. That in our hearts, we may be truly thankful for the forgiveness and mercy we receive from you each and every day. I pray that your Holy Spirit fills this space with his presence and that the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts be found acceptable and pleasing in your sight. For you alone, O Lord, are our rock and our redeemer. Amen. Now, I don't know how many of you have had this experience of maybe watching a movie or a TV show that you thought was okay or average, you didn't love it, but there is one scene that stuck out to you. Well, for me, one example of this is a scene from the musical Les Miserables. And as many of you know, I'm not a huge fan of of all things musical. Uh, But there's something about one scene that has stuck out to me ever since I watched it for the first time. To summarize, uh, Les Miserables, it's a musical that uh, tells a story about something that happened during the French Revolution. And it follows an ex-convict named Jean Valjean who turns his life from crime into becoming a better man. And the musical follows him helping a lot of people along the way. But at the beginning of the story, Valjean, before he turns his life around, he's unable to find work because he's just been released from prison and he has that mark of ex-convict over his record. Um, So he doesn't have money, he can't find work, it's in the middle of winter, he has nowhere to stay. And then we meet a character named the bishop. And after finding Valjean in the street, the bishop invites him to stay in his church for free. He tells Valjean, there is wine here to revive you. There is bread to make you strong. There's a bed to rest till morning, rest from pain, and rest from wrong. It's the first time in the story that Valjean has received any kindness from anybody. The bishop expects nothing in return. He simply invites Valjean in, prepares a feast for him, and gives him a place to rest. But remember, this is before Valjean turns his life around. So at one point, he sees the church's expensive silverware and the chalices, So he waits one night until the bishop falls asleep. He steals all the silver and chalices and escapes into the night. It's a shameless and it's an unforgivable betrayal. The bishop was nothing but kind to Valjean, but Valjean thanks him by taking complete advantage of his kindness and stealing from him. Well, when Valjean, he tries to pawn the silver off and it's immediately recognized as the bishop's. So he makes up a story that the bishop gave him the silver. Of course, no one buys that. So Valjean is arrested and he's brought back to face the bishop for what he's done. So the authorities, they bring Valjean to the bishop and they say, you know, we caught this man with your silver and he had the nerve to tell us that you gave it to him. But then to the surprise of the audience, the bishop says, that's right. I did give it to him. Then the bishop walks over to the silver candlesticks, the most expensive items that he owns, And he says, but my friend, speaking to Valjean, you left so early. Surely something slipped your mind. You forgot I gave these also. Would you leave the best behind? In an unexpected twist, the bishop affirms Valjean's cover story. He gives him even more silver after he stole from him. And as a result, Valjean is released from his arrest. As Valjean stands there completely dumbfounded as to why the bishop would do this, why he would save him, the bishop gives him these final words. But remember this, my brother. See in this some higher plan. You must use this precious silver to become an honest man. By the witness of the martyrs, by the passion and the blood, God has raised you out of darkness, and I have saved your soul for God. This is the only time the bishop appears in the entire story. But from that one scene, from that overwhelming act of mercy and forgiveness, Valjean begins to turn his life around and he becomes the hero of Les Miserables. Forgiveness is not something that comes easy to any of us. When someone hurts us, it doesn't feel natural to just forgive them, but the natural feeling is to make them feel what we felt. 
We don't like action movies where the hero forgives the villain in the end. But deep down, we like seeing the villain get what they deserve. But according to Christ, to be truly human in the way that he calls us to be is to forgive those who wrong us. Christian justice is not revenge. It's not meeting wrongdoing with equal wrongdoing. But Christian justice is offering the same forgiveness Jesus Christ has already given each of us. Peter came up and said to Jesus, Lord, how often will my brother sin against me and I forgive him? As many as seven times? Jesus said to him, I do not say to you seven times, but 77 times. So to fully understand Jesus' answer of 77, we have to go back to an often forgotten story at the very beginning of Genesis about a man named Lamech. Lamech, he was a descendant of Cain, and his short appearance in Genesis is meant to show us just how awful and evil and wicked humanity has become apart from God. Lamech is so evil, he brags about his sin, saying, I have killed a man for wounding me, a young man for striking me. If Cain's revenge is sevenfold, then Lamech's is seventy-sevenfold. At this point in Genesis, Lamech is the epitome of everything wrong with humanity. His revenge against those who do him wrong isn't just sevenfold, but it's seventy-sevenfold. So here, Jesus isn't saying, you know, 77 is the strict limit, and you can stop forgiving after 78. But he comes to show us the opposite of Lamech. Just as Lamech was quick and completely over the top in his revenge, we should be quick and completely over the top in our forgiveness. And in order to explain why, Jesus begins telling us this parable. Therefore, the kingdom of heaven may be compared to a king who wished to settle accounts with his servants. When he began to settle, one was brought to him who owed him 10,000 talents. Just a single talent in the time of Jesus would have been an incredible amount of money. A talent was worth roughly 6,000 denarii, and a denarius was worth about one day's wages for a worker. So if we were to assume a denarius is worth roughly $100, that means one talent is worth $600,000. Now that's one talent. So what about 10,000 talents? Well, if we do the math, 10,000 talents would be roughly $6 billion. $6 billion. How does someone get themselves into so much debt that they owe someone six billion dollars. The parable never tells us how he got into this debt, but we're obviously dealing with someone who isn't just foolish with their money. You would have to be intentionally reckless and fraudulent to have that kind of debt hanging over you. So here this man is, he's standing before his master, he needs to pay a debt that he could never pay in a hundred lifetimes. So the only thing he can do is beg for mercy. The servant fell on his knees, imploring him, have patience with me, and I will pay you everything. Now, this is a pretty desperate cry, because there's no way he can just come up with six billion dollars. But, in another unexpected twist, out of pity for him, the master of that servant released him and forgave him the debt. Right when we think that the parable can't get any more ridiculous and crazy, The master decides to simply forgive and let go of $6 billion. Not pay me whenever you have it, not just give me this amount and pay me the rest later, but he says, you don't have to pay me any of it, ever. It's gone. Now, who in their right mind would let such a huge debt go? At this point, we need to see how it's Jesus Christ who lets our huge debt go and forgives us. The debt we've racked up upon ourselves has the sentence of death. And all we can do is just rack up more sins, rack up more transgressions against God and our neighbor. But when we turn to Jesus Christ and say, have mercy on us and forgive us, have patience with us, he pays the debt we owe by dying our death upon the cross and frees us into an everlasting life with God. 
It's important to see that the servant in this parable is all of us. All Christians who have known the gospel mercy of Jesus Christ. We know it every Sunday morning here as a community, and we know it every day when we turn to God and ask him for forgiveness. And yet, what happens when someone turns to us for forgiveness? When that same servant went out, he found one of his fellow servants who owed him a hundred denarii, and seizing him, he began to choke him, saying, pay what you owe. So remember, one talent is worth about 6,000 denarii. And if a denarius is about a day's wages, about $100, then we're looking at a debt of roughly $10,000. Not a small amount, necessarily, but compared to $6 billion, we're looking at a drop in a bucket. So this servant, who was just forgiven $6 billion, goes after someone who owes him $10,000 and chokes him, demanding that he pay him back. His fellow servant fell down and pleaded with him, have patience with me and I will pay you. Notice how the fellow servant says nearly the exact same words as the first servant. Have patience with me and I'm going to pay you. Unlike $6 billion, $10,000 is at least possible to repay given enough time. It would have taken about a less than a year of working to earn that amount. But He refused and went and put him in prison until he should pay the debt. Now, if we're looking at this story from a strictly legal law-based perspective, then the fellow servant is technically getting what he deserves. After all, he does owe $10,000 that he can't pay. Likewise, if the bishop had told the authorities that Valjean did, in fact, steal the silver then Valjean would be getting what he deserves. After all, he did steal the silver. But what kind of story would that be? What would happen to all the people and all the lives that Valjean would save throughout Les Miserables? Not only does the servant refuse to forgive the debt, he denies his fellow servant any chance of repaying what he owes. He doesn't give him more time. He doesn't say, well, pay this amount now and just give me the rest later. He refuses to meet his fellow servant halfway and locks him away in prison. But when his master found out what happened, he summoned him and said to him, you wicked servant, I forgave you all that debt because you pleaded with me. And should not you have had mercy on your fellow servant as I had mercy on you? And in anger, his master delivered him to the jailers until he should pay all his debt. Notice that when the servant fails to forgive, he ends up in the same place as his fellow servant. Both of them are punished by being locked away. When we lack mercy against our fellow brother or sister, we may be punishing the other party in some way, but we're also punishing ourselves. As the saying goes, withholding forgiveness is like drinking poison and expecting the other person to die. Years and years ago, when I was in college, I once had a really close friend who I loaned a lot of money for a college student. It was about $800. This person, he was in a bind. He really needed the help, and he said he was going to pay me back. And so I gave him the money, but I made it clear that this was a loan. I needed the money back to help pay for my studies. Well, as you can imagine, a month goes by, it's no money. Two months go by, no money. Almost six months go by, not even a mention of paying me back or any money at all. It just kept bothering me more and more until almost a year went by, and he never made any intention to pay me back any of the money. I was so angry at this, you know, one day I decided to pull him aside, and I gave him a choice. I told him, you either come up with a plan to pay me soon, or I can't be your friend anymore. We never spoke again after that. He never reached out to me. I never reached out to him. One of my closest college friends, and it ended just like that. 
looking back, it's easy to say that he was in the wrong. You know, he should have never asked me for money he couldn't pay back. He should have at least tried to pay me back or apologize. And maybe I was right for calling him out on it. But at the same time, I lost a friend, a close friend, over money, less than $1,000. And I can't help but ask myself, was it really worth losing a friend? Was it worth losing somebody that I could have shared my life experiences with for the past 10 years? And to be frank, have I always been perfect at paying people back when I owe them money? No. The truth is, when I locked him away in jail in my mind, I was locking myself away too. So also, Jesus says, my heavenly Father will do to every one of you if you do not forgive your brother from your heart. How many of us have withheld forgiveness from someone who hurt us? Who among us has never wanted to fight fire with fire with someone who wronged us? Maybe you're even withholding forgiveness from someone right now, a relative, a coworker, a student, a family member, a client, a sibling in Christ, or maybe some stranger you'll never see again. If you find yourself withholding forgiveness this morning, then make no mistake, you're not punishing anyone but yourself. I'm not up here saying that it's easy to do. I know how much better it is to hold on to that resentment, to fantasize about all the ways you can get that person back for what they did. But Christ confronts us with the truth. We're denying the forgiveness that he first gave us. We're forsaking our cross that we're meant to pick up and follow him. And when we withhold that forgiveness, we're right there with the servant. We're locked away, guilty of sin, and carrying a huge amount of debt that we could never pay back in a hundred lifetimes. The only way we can be free from our sentence and free from our debt is the forgiveness of Jesus. As Isaiah says, he has come to proclaim liberty to the captives and the opening of the prison to those who are bound. The good news is, even if you find yourself withholding forgiveness to someone else, Christ is still good and merciful to forgive you. He knows the resentment that we carry, and he calls us to lay it down at his feet. The order we find in the Lord's Prayer is intentional in this way. Forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. That's the first step of forgiving the sins of others, calling upon God to forgive us first for harboring it ourselves. The next step is harder, but it's important. And that's letting go of the sin committed against us. It doesn't mean forgetting the sin. It doesn't mean pretending the sin never happened. But it means we no longer hold the debt over that person. It means we give up any idea of being compensated for the pain they caused us. And it means accepting them as a broken sinner of need of mercy, just like ourselves. We don't do this alone. But thanks be to God, we have the power of the Holy Spirit who already brings about God's forgiveness in us each and every time we turn to him, asking for patience. One of the many great things in our tradition as Lutherans is how unmistakable God's mercy and forgiveness is towards us. When we leave this place every Sunday morning, we don't have much room to wonder, you know, gee, did I really encounter Christ this morning? Or, you know, I didn't really feel the spirit in worship today. Did God really forgive my sins? We know he did. Not because we felt it, but because we heard the forgiveness at the beginning of the service. And we eat and drink that forgiveness from the altar. Likewise, may our forgiveness of those who trespass against us be unmistakable. Let it be clear and intentional toward the one who offended us. But most importantly, may it be vested in the forgiveness first worked within all of us. By the witness of the martyrs, 
by the passion and the blood. God has raised us out of darkness. He has saved our souls for God. Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen.